Okay, so the topic of today's video will be evolution by natural selection. So let's go ahead and get started. Well, before getting into natural selection, I want to mention artificial selection, and that's basically selective breeding of dogs and crops and livestock, and we've been doing it for centuries. Great example are wolves. Through selective breeding, we've bred all kinds of variety of domesticated dogs by controlling the breeding of, for instance, wolves. We've been able to cause change in dogs. Well, we see this in plants as well, you know, in crops, you know, through selective breeding of wild mustard, we've actually produced, you know, Brussels sprouts and cabbage and kale and all the vegetables you probably hated as a kid. But through selective breeding of wild mustard have been able to produce these various types of food products. You know, we've been able to produce bigger and meatier livestock, cows, chickens, pigs over the centuries by controlling which ones are able to reproduce with one another. So we've actually caused change, humans have actually caused change to many organisms on this planet. So in artificial selection, humans are the driving force. We are the ones that are selecting the, the desirable trait that we want to enhance when we allow one organism to breed with another organism. And so the whole point of artificial selection is that it proves that by controlling the breeding of how organisms reproduce with one another, that over time this can lead to change. Now the question is, can this process of change happen naturally without human interference? Science believes the answer is yes, and that would be natural selection. So that brings us to natural selection, the process through which organisms with advantageous traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. You know, this theory was proposed by Charles Darwin, and you might know that on board the HMS Beagle, he set forth on a five-year journey that wrapped around, you know, South America and explored various parts of the world, and they made a couple important stops at the Galapagos Islands, and here he observed, you know, wildlife and made some observations that would change the direction of natural history. You know, for instance, he observed that finches, which are a type of bird, finches all possess different type of beaks that seem to help them survive in their particular islands. And, you know, after mulling over his observations and meeting with other experts in, at the time, in 1859, he eventually writes and publishes the book, The Origin of Species. And in this book, he outlined, you know, the process of natural selection, which, uh, you know, has been refined over the years. But the core concept, the main idea, is that if organisms possess an advantage, they're more likely to survive and reproduce. Well, let's go into that. You know, there's really four factors that influence natural selection. And the first being that nature tends to overpopulate, meaning more individuals are born than are going to survive. For instance, will all of these fish eggs uh, live long enough to reach adulthood age? No, many of them are going to die and be food for other aquatic organisms. You know, will all of these seeds uh, survive long enough to grow into mature plants and trees? No, many of these seeds are going to perish. They'll be food for other organisms. You know, will all of these lion cubs live into their adulthood years of life? No, probably not. Uh, there's a struggle to survive in nature, so nature tends to overpopulate. In my animation, the rabbits are multiplying, they're reproducing. Now, will all of these rabbits survive in the wild? No, probably not. Some of them are going to fall victim to predators. Well, our second factor is that there are variations within individuals of a population. Now, this population of rabbits has two major distinguishable variations, mostly brown in color and mostly white in color. Well, the third factor is that some of these variations allow a better chance for survival because we know that there is a struggle to survive. And what we mean by that is there are, are for instance, predators like wolves that are on the hunt for rabbits. It doesn't matter if they're brown. It doesn't matter if they're white. The wolves are hungry and they want to feed. So as the wolves go out hunting, you know, maybe they catch a brown rabbit. Even though the brown ones are a little harder to see, the white ones stand out a little more in this particular environment. So as the wolves now continue to hunt, maybe a white rabbit is captured. 
And because white stands out a little bit more, more and more of the white rabbits tend to be captured. So as time goes by, there's just fewer and fewer of the white rabbits reproducing and surviving. And here we see another white rabbit fall victim to the wolves. So as time passes, the white rabbits are becoming very, very threatened. Now, being brown in color, does that guarantee survival? Of course not. As the white rabbits become fewer and fewer in number and population size, the wolves are going to have to start hunting the brown ones. So even within the brown rabbits, there's variation because some of them might be faster, some of them might be slower, some of them might be meatier, some of them might be skinnier. And here we see a brown rabbit captured. And so finally, the last of the white rabbits has been hunted and the white rabbits are no longer existing in this ecosystem. So that brings us to our fourth factor is that over time, those with the advantages tend to make up most of the population. Now, did the white rabbits turn into brown rabbits? No, of course not. The white rabbits were hunted and eliminated by the wolves. They no longer exist in this particular ecosystem. So this is what we mean by the survival of the fittest. In this environment, the brown rabbits were more fit. They were more likely to survive and reproduce. You know, all these buffaloes have little variations, but are they all going to survive? You know, that one's shorter, that one's fatter, that one has bigger horns, that one's faster. Are they all going to survive? No. There's a struggle to survive. Only the more fit ones are the ones better likely to survive and reproduce. You know, these fish even have little tiny variations. Are they all going to survive? You know, that one might have a little bit of a deformed fin, and that one might have poor eyesight. That one might have a faster metabolism. That one might have little brighter colors. And so are all of them going to survive? Of course not. No, there is a struggle to survive. Only the fish that are most fit will be able to survive and reproduce. You know, it's no different in plants. Are all these trees going to survive in the wild? They all have little variations. You know, that one might have bigger thorns. That one might produce less chlorophyll. That one might have softer wood. Are they all going to survive? No. There's a struggle to survive. Only the more fit plants and trees are going to be the ones that survive and reproduce. You know, I've mentioned a few times that there's a struggle to survive. And what I mean by that is that there are limiting factors. There are factors that will slow or stop population growth that nature has to contend with. You know, this graph right here shows human population going back about 10,000 BC. And for much of human history, the human population was very small and grew at a very slow and steady pace. But then a couple hundred years ago, we see that the human population has skyrocketed. And now one thing that we know is that, you know, this cannot continue forever. Eventually, there's going to be a lack of resources that will prevent this from continuing to grow at this rate. But uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, what are some of these limiting factors that affect not just human life, but all other life on this planet. You know, pause the video right now and try to think of what are some examples of limiting factors. I'm going to go over a couple in three, two, one. You know, examples of limiting factors might be a lack of resources, such as drinking water, resources such as shelter, resources such as food. Other examples of limiting factors could be predators. Other examples could be disease. You know, as populations tend to get bigger, disease tends to be more common. Acts of nature can limit a population from growing, such as forest fires and hurricanes. You know, these are all examples that, that limit the size of population growth. So the ability to survive is aided by fitness. Now, when you think of fitness, maybe this picture kind of pops into your mind, but that's not the type of fitness we're talking about. Fitness means the ability to survive and produce offspring. Well, this owl has high fitness because it blends into its snowy environment. It's better able to survive and therefore reproduce. Now, this katydid is an insect that looks an awful lot like a leaf. Well, this insect, because it looks like a leaf, is able to blend into its environment. It's more likely to survive and reproduce. It has high fitness as well. So if we come back to these brown rabbits from earlier, these rabbits have high, have high fitness in this particular environment. But if the environment were to be changed, 
you know, do the rabbits still have high fitness in this snowy environment? You can see the answer is no. They're going to be easily hunted by the Arctic wolves. Ironically, the, the white rabbits from earlier would probably have much greater fitness in this particular environment, and they would be the ones who would survive and reproduce. So looking at the human population graph from earlier, due to our high intelligence and our ability to solve problems, humans have very high fitness. This is why our population is currently growing exponentially. We've been able to fight back disease. We've been able to build shelters. We've been able to produce more food. And so therefore, we have high fitness and we're able to survive in environments where in the past we've not been able to. Now, why do all the fish in this school look almost identical in appearance? Well, because this is the appearance that produces high fitness. Individual fish that didn't look like this had low fitness, and they most likely died out long ago. Well, why do cacti have sharp thorns on them? Well, because the thorns prevent herbivores from eating them. Thorns add to their fitness. And so therefore, any cacti without these sharp thorns would have died a long time ago. You know, why do giraffes have a long neck? Is it because they stretched to reach treetops? No, not at all. Giraffes have a long neck because it helps them reach their food, and this increases their fitness. Giraffes without long necks would have starved. Giraffes with genetically longer necks had an advantage. They reproduced, they made babies with genetically longer necks, and there you go, all the giraffes with shorter necks were eliminated due to natural selection. So I want to start mentioning a couple examples of natural selection in action today, and what better way to start than by talking about antibiotics. You know, antibiotics are medicines that are designed to kill bacteria infections. Now, antibiotics can kind of trace their origins back to, to Dr. Alexander Fleming, who discovered the very first antibiotic called penicillin back in 1928. And in his lab, uh, Dr. Fleming was growing bacteria on petri dishes. And so it was very common, here's a petri dish, and here's some bacteria smeared all over the petri dish. You know, this is a, a very common sight for Dr. Fleming and when he was studying bacteria. So on returning from vacation, Dr. Fleming noticed something strange when he examined a dirty petri dish. What he noticed is that there was a big blob of mold, which is a type of fungus, growing on the petri dish. Now, that in itself wasn't strange. You know, if you leave uh, dirty dishes out and dirty food out and old food, it's going to attract mold and fungus. That wasn't the strange thing that he observed. What he noticed is that surrounding the fungus, there is a zone where there was no bacteria growing. So he wonders, could the fungus, could the mold be releasing some kind of chemical that is killing the bacteria? And then could this chemical be actually harvested and used to help fight bacteria infections? And Eventually, after a lot of research, a couple other individuals, a couple other scientists were able to isolate and purify and mass-produce penicillin. And penicillin was mass-produced just in time for World War II, and its success was seen as a miracle cure for many life-threatening bacteria infections that had existed in the past. Well, how do antibiotics actually kill bacteria? Here's some bacteria cells, and when you take an antibiotic, and that's what the black dots are, antibiotics, when you take an antibiotic, they actually absorb into the bacteria cell. And then what they do is they poke little holes in the cells of the bacteria and eventually cause the bacteria to burst, therefore ending the bacteria infection, and therefore you're on your road to recovery. But what we're seeing is that there are some bacteria that possess genes, pieces of DNA, that allow them to resist the action of the antibiotic. And that's what the bacteria is labeled R. We're going to pretend they have the resistant gene in them. So when you take the antibiotic, the antibiotic enters all the bacteria. Now only the bacteria without the resistance have their cells poked holes in and eventually they die. 
the ones that are resistant are surviving and eventually going to reproduce. So as time passes, the resistant bacteria have survived and now they're reproducing. And I hope you see where this is uh, potentially a problem because instead of your bacteria infection going away and you getting better, you're now left with resistant bacteria. Thus, antibiotics today are becoming less effective. And this is a real big problem as we continue to struggle to find ways to fight bacteria infections. Okay, so here's a little Petri dish here. And the, this Petri dish has bacteria growing on it. The bacteria can be seen in the background, the hazy color in the background of the, of the Petri dish. Each white disc has been treated with a different antibiotic, and I've just labeled the white discs A through I. Okay, if you're in class, I want you to you know, turn to your neighbor, but right now pause the video and try to answer this question. If you were infected with this bacteria, which antibiotics could you use to treat the infection? I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So the antibiotics that you could use would be, you can see the ones that are left. The three that disappeared, you would not want to use to treat this. Well, how do we know this? When we notice around, for instance, antibiotic A, there's a clear zone free of bacteria. No bacteria reside in that clear zone. This means the antibiotic is successfully killing the bacteria. And you can see a clear zone around A, D, F, G, H, and I. Well, you know, we're actually seeing a similar pattern through the use of pesticides. In this picture, a tractor is spraying pesticides on crops and pesticides are used are chemicals that are used to kill rodents and insects and caterpillars turns out however some of these pests are resistant they have genes in them that will resist the pesticide and then when they survive and reproduce with other survivors who are also resistant, other babies are resistant. So over time, the pesticides become less and less and less effective. You know, this is one way we might want to consider supporting more the more use of organic farming, which is farming without the use of artificial chemicals and pesticides. You know, I want to take a moment to recognize Rachel Carson, the scientist who authored the book Silent Spring, one of the most influential science books ever written. In her book, she outlined the pesticide DDT. Here's DDT being sprayed into a lake, and here's DDT being sprayed over a forest. Now, this was done to help fight off mosquitoes and some of the diseases that they might spread. Well, it turns out DDT is a carcinogen, meaning it causes cancer. And she uncovered this in her research that she was doing for the book Silent Spring. And eventually, uh, the, the research that she had performed led to DDT eventually being banned in the United States. And so I just wanted to quickly recognize Rachel Carson for the influential work that she performed. Well, we're also seeing this pattern with the use of fungicides. You know, here's a person's foot with athlete's foot fungus. And fung fungicides are medicines used to kill fungal infections. You know, most fungi die when you use a fungicide, but some are resistant, and the resistant ones will reproduce with others. Again, it's survival of the fittest. We also see this with antiviral medicines, which are used to end a virus infection. Most viruses are eliminated, but some are resistant, and those resistant will multiply so it is survival of the fittest. So there you have it. Um, if you're in my biology class, you know, pause the video, try to answer these questions. I'm happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. And, you know, perhaps leave a comment in the box below. I'd love to hear what you thought about this video. Thanks for watching.